Hey guys, welcome to episode 26 of 4, our brand new podcast by the Rep Knights. We conjure dreams, we forge the future, we execute the vision as filmmakers, but we're also brilliant podcasters. I'm your host, Ray Jenjua, and I want you to subscribe to us on CastBox, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. We are everywhere. We're on Breaker, and now we're on YouTube and Facebook. So season one's on our Facebook page, but you can follow us via our website rightipro.com if you love tech you love tech reviews you love movie reviews you love gaming reviews and more the house of rep has it so stay tuned for another great episode we're going to be talking about bill and ted's bogus journey one of my all-time favorite films it's going to be a fun episode here at the house of rep Okay, so the podcast is growing. Thanks for liking, sharing, and subscribing. We're on YouTube. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcast. We're also on CastBox, Anchor FM, where it all started. So definitely wherever you want to listen to this podcast, please subscribe, share, and tell people about it. I'm also on FB. You can follow us at Rep Nights. And um, the team are on there and we're, we're making some magic. We've got some cool stuff coming up. I just want to introduce Z, who's going to be also on the show. So Z, say hi to everyone. Hey everyone, welcome, welcome to the house. All right, bro, let's get into it. So Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Bro, this film is dope. Yeah, this is one cool. of our all-time favorite films. Now, tell me what you, how you felt the first time you saw this film. Well, we saw Bill and Ted, I think, was on, again, on, like, a recording or a TV uh, uh, so showing the first, of the film. The first time we ever saw it was a, was a terrestrial broadcast, but I can't remember whether it was a BBC, ITV, or Channel 4 film, because Channel 4, 5 wasn't around back yeah. then. So, I, I'm pretty sure Channel 4 had the rights to this film, because they used to... They used to be really kind of out there with their movie selection. You know, this is before Film 4 was created. So they would pick some amazing movies. So um, I think a lot of a lot of the really great movies that like, you know, that we discovered these kind of rare movies, they're from Channel 4 days. That's the kind of feeling yeah. I get from the first time we watched it. Because the first Bill and Ted was a Channel 4 terrestrial viewing for us because these films had already come out in the cinema. And we hadn't started going to the cinema yet. We were still quite, you know, like, it was a new experience for us, you know, going to the cinema. We didn't go very often. I remember my first cinema experience that I can definitely remember was Disney's Aladdin. So that film made a massive impression on me. Uh, you know, it was, it was amazing. I mean, I must have gone to the cinema probably before that as a small child, but I literally cannot remember you know, I could have gone with my parents to see something else that they wanted to watch. But the one that made a resounding impact on me was Disney's Aladdin. And that film's phenomenal, the original. The remake, not so much. The one by Guy Ritchie. But the original animated film, that was really amazing. Uh, going back to this film, it's a lot darker. But it's also fun. It's really cool. Uh, so Z set it up for them, like, you know, uh, what, what are the kind of like some of the changes in this movie, like as they progress forward? Yeah, cool. So we see Bill and Ted, uh, back again in California and they're living the life and they're still trying to do their kind of thing with the Wild Stallions mm -hmm. band. Mm -hmm. They're still trying to, uh, become successful and write awesome music. Um, but obviously Bill and Ted have kind of gone through a slight change compared to the first film. Obviously the production value of the film has gotten a lot bigger. You know, the budget is a lot bigger in this film. The characters are a bit more larger than life mm -hmm. in the sequel, in mm. Bogus Journey. And we kind of get introduced to San Dimas and Rufus is teaching a class at the start of the movie in the utopian future in, isn't in it? the utopian kind of future that is being yeah. created by bill and ted and their music slightly different production design on the utopian yeah. future too it has a very kind of like um i would say that you know that that kind of 80s plexiglass kind of tables you know the tricolor very white, sunglasses sterile. and stuff you know like where everyone's kind of wearing like um creams and whites and the fashion is very weird basically they're wearing like over enlarged clothes with 
multicolored kind of headdresses and stuff. It feels like they're at some kind of fancy dress party. And they've got all these kind of like strange bags and stuff, and it's it's very nineties kind of futurism. Yeah, like na yeah nineties futurism where everything's enlarged and stuff. And they've got little kind of like ear things, you know, and com portable computers and stuff. I mean, looking back at it now, I mean, they would they would probably be like looking at if we showed them our smartphones and said, <laughs> "This is actually how the future's gonna they're be." Like, what? We'd be blowing their minds because they they're thinking that we're still using CRTs and stuff. You know, and, and but but it had a couple of ideas like about hands free and stuff, which is really, really cool. Um, we I get, actually I still love this to movie Rufus man, again so at much. The star, isn't it? Rufus is great. So George Carlin grew his hair out, so he's rocking a ponytail. Like I'm rocking my long hair right now. You know, like he he was looking really dapper and cool. <laughs> now they introduced a new character called Anomalous. Yeah. You know, and that's the whole theme of this film because the original film film was called Excellent Adventure. This one's called Bogus Journey, and if you look at the font design, that's intentionally done by the director and the actual scriptwriters and the whole creative team, that this would be a darker take, because it's like a darker sequel. Like Empire, you know, like how most sequels are, they're dark. So I think Orion going in and everyone going in when they when they planned this film, they, they, they were going for a darker kind of, Much more you know, animated. like to kind of show it's a little bit darker. Because what had happened was is that a lot of hair metal was kind of going out and a lot of grunge was coming in so even like uh you know this um, is the kind of era of Soundgarden, Nirvana, yeah those yeah. kind of bands have heavily influenced this film yeah so like uh, you know you got bands like uh what's that band called the one um the tom and the cat tom guys and the cat guy oh man their name is like out of my head right now but they did that they did that wicked song for uh oh man what's their name Anyway, we'll find out. <laughs> we'll find the name. I'll Google their name. Uh, but basically, they were cool, man. And uh, what else, man? Yeah, so Bogus Journey has a lot of lovely references Primus. to Primus. great bands like Primus. Yeah, so Primus are in it and uh, stuff. Obviously, Rage and stuff like that. All the 90s bands that were really cool in the kind of grunge and uh, heavy metal movement at that time during the 90s, yeah. the early 90s. I mean, 90s. Winger, one of my all-time favorite bands, just to jump in. Winger is like one of... Kip Winger and Red Beach and the guys, yeah, they're freaking awesome. And, uh, you know, the film has such an amazing uh, soundtrack. The, yeah. the Battle Station song, to this day always fires me up when i listen to it like when i'm riding or i see that scene that's one of the scenes that made me want to become a film director when stations building the new robot buses. i've jumped ahead a little but i just wanted to say that you know i really want to thank kip winger and red beach and the guys for making such an awesome soundtrack it's a shame they're not in the film because yeah. you see primus like primus have a, a, a cameo, cameo. And you're only hearing the end of um, Tommy the Cat, I think it is. Yeah, because they yeah. what it, what the premise is now in this film is that they have to enter a battle of the bands mm -hmm. concert. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing their high school report, they're not doing that this time around. Yeah, this They've is supposed got to be. Yeah. They've got their band. Yeah, they want the band to be successful, and they think that entering this competition will make them really successful. Yeah, this will basically like what's supposed to happen is historically this was supposed to set them up and then that's where Denomalous comes in. Denomalous is um, the new Rufus's old history teacher or something and he's become very disillusioned with the um, with the u utopian future. He feels that Bill and Ted are actually the opposite. He's, he's like he's got some sort of a group some kind of like Faction. evil group that kind of also a little bit undermines the utopian society uh, idea that they brought about world peace because um you know like it's very highly debatable that because if it's a utopian society is there still a kind of like uh anarchistic kind of fringe element in their society this film kind of proves that most of the society is tolerant with each other and the government and everything has become free but there's a few ardent um you know like selfish people with their own kind of ideologies who are um so yeah, the anarchistic fringes, you know, of society are still kind of explored in this film, where um, there's an there's an element that doesn't agree with the status quo, and they're actively trying to kind of um, you know destroy what this is. 
So they attack Rufus's classroom. And then what happens is you find out that Anomalous is actually a fantastic inventor and engineer. And he's modeled um, these evil androids that he's built, like cybernetic androids on Bill and Ted. And they obviously reveal their innards and stuff and make basically the Ut Utopian society kind of worship Bill and Ted kind of not, I would say not like prophets, but very revered um, sages, yeah. you know, so, so when they, the start, so when one or two see them, they faint and they feel sick from it because like, it's like almost like an abuse of um, these amazing figures. So, so what happened was, is that um, Rufus has a guitar. He has like some kind of special like neon looking guitar and he uses it kind of like a grappling hook. Him. So what happens is, is that when the two Bill and Ted's say death to Bill and Ted and they're basically going to go kill him time, yeah. and everyone's all shocked that Denomalous is sending these people back to kill Bill and Ted, uh, Rufus follows them. So what Rufus does is he throws his guitar at the last minute and he has his guitar lead that he uses as like a, 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 a rope and it drags him into the, to the circuits of time. The guards try to shoot him but he doesn't get hurt because they miss. And then he kind of disappears. So what probably happened was is that Rufus fell a little bit forward and had to create some kind of a suit to become, because later on it's revealed that he's a lady played by um, Pam Greer, I think it is, um, but which is a bit weird. But that that's like the, <laughs> the weirdest bit in, the, in, in, in that part uh, in the entire film. But they're married to the princesses still, and the princesses can play. So they're the only competent members of the band. Yeah. Bill and Ted still haven't totally learned how to play yet. And they also don't really have the same kind of guitars that they won in the first film. So those two kind of, um, you know, I can't remember what they call like Schneibergers or whatever like that. Those kind of advanced guitars that they have. They don't have those anymore. He's rocking like a SG and uh, Alex Winter's got like a Les Paul or something. Two really tight guitars, you know. Also, the phone booth has changed. Yes. This was something that I wanted to talk to you about, Z. What did you think of the phone booth change? Yeah, I like it. It's gone through kind of like a redesign. So, mm -hmm. obviously, like we said, the production design is a lot better on this film. The prop design is better. So, what they've done is they've redesigned the phone booth to have like a slight dome on the top. And then mm -hmm. it has like some animation and some sort of movement to show that it's going to go through the circuits of time. Yeah, so the actual phone booth itself is pretty similar inside, but what they changed was the actual antenna design. It's kind of yeah. like a, a sort of like a protruding. A modernized. Yeah, like a, they modernized it a little bit, and I liked it. I like I like the traditional phone booth. I like the second phone booth. It's really cool. Uh, there's a lot of wicked kind of cinematography choices with the lighting and the mood. So like Sam Dimas is very light. Yeah. But then, you know, like when the evil uh, Bill and Ted come, you see that what happens is that the evil Bill and Ted are really smart. When they arrive, they pretend that they're their future selves. Yeah. So they kind of say, hey, follow us. We've got to go do shit. Yeah. But then it turns out that they're, they, trick they're, they trick them. So when Bill and Ted try to fight them, obviously they're metal and they can't kill them and they're super strong. So they and basically a, a lot get of the jokes are more adult. Like yeah. To show the maturity. Yeah. Of so there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff. Another funny thing that you find out at the start of the film is is that like obviously his dad's still pressurizing him to go military school, and now Missy has divorced Bill's dad, and is married to Ted's dad. <laughs> so that's really hilarious. So yeah. now so now kind of uh, Bill and Ted are sort of like sort of kind of brothers but not step really brothers, like step brothers kind of, I don't know how it works but it's for hilarious and then um, his dad's like really depressed and stuff because of it like you know that he once had Missy and now he doesn't have her anymore and stuff so Missy's quite funny like in that sense she just kind of like just as a like a tall man eater she just yeah. loves to get different guys but also there's like really nice undertones with the parallels of the evil Bill and Ted so Mm. Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter have to play the evil Bill and Ted's with a different and they kind do of it well. style and they do it really well yeah. because they have to be more they're more callous they're more psychotic characters they're more evil and they do stuff that normal Bill and Ted would not do it shows up Alex's range really yeah. well too because Alex is a very good like actor with a theater background and he's a very good director too a lot of people don't realize that he did um he did a few documentaries, like well-known documentaries. If you look out for his stuff, he did some really cool stuff back in the day. You know when uh, 
all the first kind of like banking crises happened and stuff, he was doing some really cool stuff. So, um, in this film, they do a lot of wicked kind of like gags where like they pull their heads off and they, you know, like they do stuff. Classic, classic kind of yeah. 90s tricks. Oh man, it's so cool because also what's really cool is they use that mountain that Kirk fought on. Yeah. You know, so so, so I, I think the Gorn. They, I think you know I think they show the Gorn fight yeah. like they're watching on, it on the, on the yeah. TV. So they're watching it on There's TV. Like a, so they're watching Kirk versus trivia. the Gorn, and he's walking up the same mountain. Then later on, they're taken up that mountain, and then they're thrown off of it and die. So when they die, the Reaper comes, and then they basically tell the Reaper to kind of like go stuff himself. So this is this is Bill Sadler. This is William Sadler. If anyone. Anyone knows William Sandler's work? He's a phenomenal actor. So this is the very first time yeah. I saw him in a movie as Death, and he was amazing. Then I saw him as um, a character in um, Star Trek: Deep Space Nine. He played like a Section Thirty One operative, and he was amazing in that too. I can't remember what the name of his character was, but that was an amazing one. I'll touch on that when I do a Deep Space Nine review, but that was like one of the kind of like standout arcs in um, in DS9, you know, the whole Bashir Section 31 stuff, you know, him being kind of like an agent in real life, you know, because he was he was loved that whole spy thing. And then the guy kind of picked up on that and used Bashir in that way because he knew Bashir would be a good spy for him. So that it was really cool. And Bill Sadler just plays a funny death in this, like really fun death. And what happens is, is that the guys... They're, uh, they're going to hell and it takes forever. Yeah, for yeah, the drop. The hell. drop I'll touch on. The drop <laughs> makes you laugh. But before the drop happens, though, they're kind of like specters in on Earth. You know, like how people haunt stuff? So it plays on that kind of like ideology that, that some people stay behind because they don't want to go heaven or hell. They don't want to let go. So they basically start haunting their family. So first they go to see their dad to try and tell their dad they died so him and his colleague get possessed and he's like i'm totally possessing my dad dude you know it's like so the actor who plays the father um he's acting like keanu like and it's just so funny and then instead of like him having an electric guitar he has like an old jazz guitar kind of sound that's just <laughs> quite funny and then when they go to try to basically kind of talk to missy and she's like into this kind of weird seance. new age kind of seance stuff with her her kind of like um, friends. valley friends, you know, like she's got a little valley clique that she hangs out with, you know, uh, and it's the writers, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So it's Ed and Thing <laughs> who are like, they have the cameos writers. as those valley friends of hers, right? So basically they have like an exorcism and they think the seance has gone wrong. So she, she says some weird Latin stuff and that's what kind of basically sends them to hell. And that's why they're falling like forever down down into hell. Like, oh, yeah. And then they end up in their own personal hells. And then for like Bill and Ted, they're bad. So for for Ted, it's like the Easter Bunny uh, and the military school. Yeah. So what happened was is that Ted ate all the the kind of Easter eggs that were for his little brother, and he felt immense guilt for that. And then the Easter Bunny basically is chasing him. He's like a kind of evil Chucky style kind yeah, of Easter that's Bunny. Yeah, very exaggerated. Yeah, and like animated and then and, and then for Ted and Bill, they have the Colonel, who's basically from the military school, but not the real life version of him. A sort of like a demon kind of image of him, which is forcing them to do push ups and you know suffer. Like they have to do infinity, basically, like an infinity amount of push ups. And I was like, you know, that was the very first time as a kid I learned what infinity was as well, <laughs> you know, and stuff. So it was really funny. And then um, Bill's personal hell is his granny. He yeah. was always afraid of her old age and scared of her. Because she had like, you know, a very advanced kind of like, um, she was very, you know, advanced in her years. And for him as a young child, you know, that, that kind of image of someone all withered away and kind of like old and stuff scared him. I think he has like a fear of, of getting old and not leaving some kind of legacy behind. So there's something, there's some, there's some kind of subtext in there about, you know, like what it feels for him, you know, like to, to express affection to someone. And also he's a little just like for for him he's a little grossed out by his granny you know because she's just like aging and she's yeah, got like the yellowing of the teeth. teeth and you know stuff like that so so what's really interesting about that scene though <laughs> is that um alex winter plays his grandma yeah so he's in prosthetics so that's amazing like that's a really good performance by him it's really fun it's a fun moment 
And then, you don't, you don't know. We didn't notice that straight away. It took us a long time to figure that out after watching the film a good few times. Yeah, because when we were kids, we kind of like couldn't really like we didn't really totally suss that. Uh, second or like third time viewing, I guess we kind of picked up on it that it was him, isn't it? Like, yeah. uh, uh, and that was really cool. Then they have to play the Reaper to basically go back to kind of like that purgatory kind of area. Yeah, this is the and, funniest sequence. And that's sequence. a really funny kind of little um, slow sequence of events um, where they're playing, playing all kinds of games. Like Twister, games. Um, you know, so, like I would say it's Sabuio, but it's not Sabuio. It's like the American football version of Sabuio. Like, um, I don't know if, no one's probably going to remember Sabuio, but Sabuio was this weird game where you would have these motorized um avatars yeah that look like football players and they were kind of remote controlled and you could make them kick the ball and advance your uh well, your pieces the on a magnetic is, it? board the, it was weird in the 90s there was a good trend of board games and stuff yeah, like that yeah 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 tabletop stuff made made a bit of a comeback yeah now so some people make some really advanced board games that you can get like via you know like uh, direct shipping and stuff and like you know things like that and you go to like games workshop and kind of other comic book stores and then you can find them uh you know like places like that but um you don't often because you know what toys r us has gone into administration now which is like kind of like for me quite sad because i just loved it i used to i used to love going to toys r us and just looking at the toys because i'm just like a and big we kid could, we could see all the yeah all the board games so the board games are all there and i used to love it because like you could see them and twister was fun i used to play twister <laughs> when i was a kid you know so so Twister was like, you know, a really hard game, especially when you got like the yellow or, or <laughs> green in the most awkward place. You had yeah, to do so, what Death did. So, so they play a lot of games with Death, isn't it? Yeah, so they play so many games with Death. And they also Melvin him as well, the first time they meet him. So if you don't know what a Melvin is, a Melvin's like a wedgie. So basically they gave him like what they call a wedgie, which is a Melvin. So like you know that bit's funny too but also so, they look different when they're like specters isn't it yeah so like that's another thing about the the kind of cinematography so when they die uh the, the color is desaturated in the scene so so whenever they're dead it's very kind of like Gray, pale mute. and muted and stuff even when they're playing death it's got this wicked cinematography where it's got some kind of like a so like a blue filter, like a kind of like a desaturation filter on it. Now I think a lot of these filters back then were actually in camera, as well. They were yeah. they were they were Difficult. cinematography decisions and production design decisions from the director, which shows their prowess as filmmakers. And that's what's really beautiful about this. This doesn't look like this was digital tricks. This looks like this was actually made a lot by um, sorry in camera. And that's another reason why I really Practical love this effects. film a lot. And then the other thing that's uh, really cool is when they go to hell and they go to the different kinds of personal hells that they have. Oh, I forgot to mention, there's this giant asteroid that they land on. Oh, yeah. Like it's a rock. <laughs> but the rocks are all chained to this giant kind of furnace looking mouth with a massive looking kind of like um, devil creature that looks like the devil. And he and then they say some stuff. They're like, you know, heavy metal, dude. Give him the devil sign. So basically, they're just jumping around, <laughs> giving the devil horns, yeah. And then uh, Lucifer or whoever this kind of demon king or whatever this demon uh, janitor or caretaker, right, who's sending people to hell, yeah, sees them and then he says something to them, and then they're the ones who basic he basically sends them down into the inner structure. Well, the furnace, which is like, you know, the art direction is, is that hell is kind of like one giant furnace with like infinite rooms of your own personal hell. And then like, I guess Lucifer and the demons feed off of your sorrow or something. And that's where your energy goes. But like they, they are running away from that. So the cinematography, they use all a lot of like fisheye cameras to create this feeling of claustrophobia, you know. Whereas, you know, later on when they end up in heaven, like they're... they're after, after they beat death. After they, after they beat death, because I'm jumping forward again, um, basically what happens is, is that they beat death and then death takes them to heaven. And then they have to kind of like knock out three people who are trying to get into the gates of heaven <laughs> and then dress up as them. <laughs> and then, um, you know, like so, so dresses, uh, death is dressed up as like some lady with his scythe. And they come to the door, like, there's, the, there's this kind of, like, check-in kind of area where there's this, like, kind of um, concierge kind of dude. And he's like, you know, what's your names? And, you know... Oh, what is the meaning of life? Yeah, what is the meaning of life or whatever he asks them. And then they, they say something deep. 
And then um, Death says something <laughs> funny, and then the guy Every says, the, "He's like, how's this stuff?" Exactly. So it's so <laughs> funny. And then the guy thinks, like, do I do I know you from somewhere? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And he's like, no. Yeah, yeah. And then they go, um, like, into these massive pearly gates. You know, like the pearly gates. That's like, you know, the, the kind of, like, um, personification of what the gates of heaven would be like. And then they go up these stairs, which have these kind of, like, statues that look kind of like Greek, Masonic, kind of... I don't know what they are, but they're statues. Yeah. And then they could be, like, avatars of God. I'm not too sure yet. I don't want, I'm not going too into the whole religious and metaphysical kind of like um thing but i i used to think about it a lot when i was a kid and sometimes it would make me a little bit melancholy and sad about like dying but also it made me wonder if there was a heaven so you know like it's still kind of up in the air uh you know like uh like of what's out there everyone's got their own kind of belief system and we're not here to basically say anyone's right or wrong like everyone's got their own kind of beliefs but it's interesting but the film is an interesting uh, interpretation yeah, of that different yeah it's like one. it's so interesting that like the director wants to explore that so it's just a very interesting thing to see it's really it's really nice so they actually talk to the voice of god like they're in their reality yeah. what the voice of god would be <laughs> and then god basically sends them down this map you yeah. know like so this energy orb comes down and he creates this he map on and then they go and meet lots of different kind of like passed on biblical f uh, not biblical i was about to say biblical figures historical. but historical figures that have passed on so i think it was like thomas edison or some i don't know who it was those albert guys einstein. albert einstein was one of them but i forgot the other guy I, I don't know who the other guy was i think it was edison or something but basically they meet Station. Now Station's a really interesting character because this is a brilliant puppeteering. And I can't remember if like this is Stan Winston's studio or somebody else who did this amazing work. Yeah. But the puppeteering for these guys are really wicked. Station are supposed to be two aliens. And they were like the greatest inventors of all time or something. And then everyone thinks that the greatest inventors of all time are from Earth or something. Yeah. Like, you know... And then Station comes with them. They're like two little twins. Yeah. So Station comes with them. And um, they head back down to Earth. But then Death falls down to Earth. <laughs> which is so funny. He takes a proper hit. He, he like, you know, like one of those kind of Acme style bombs. Yeah. Where he goes, ah, and crashes into the ground. Then they get their van back. So what they do is they go to um, what is the equivalent of home base. You know, like we have home base in oh, England, like a, a, a B and Q home kind Depot. of thing. They go to Home, home Depot, Depot, which is a yeah. American so the American style one is Home Home Depot. So they go there and they start getting stuff. So like it's so funny because like Death's walking through the aisles, right? With with Station or not in with Station. Trolley. I think Station and them lot in the car. But Station have given them a list of stuff to do. So Station are not walking around. Go, but go and get this. Yeah. Shit. So so. They go to get stuff, and then some guy's smoking, and he goes, I'll see you soon. And then the guy starts <laughs> coughing and choking on the cigarette. It's so funny. And then he kind of gets like a gardening rake and swipes it. And then and he's, he's like, looking nah. at his uh, scythe. He's like, nah, my scythe is better. <laughs> so that's so funny. And then, you know, when they, when they get to... Um, in the meantime, Bill's trying to contact uh, the, um, his, the girls, the princesses. You know, he's trying to get through the Missy. He's like, they're not yeah, there. Because, because what happened is, in is the that... In the intermittent time while they're dead... Yeah, you see... You see, to set it up, they, they jack that Porsche, don't they? And they do that with Yeah, shit, so right? in the intermittent time when, obviously, the real Bill and Ted are dead, the evil Bill and Ted, uh, the evil us, as they call them in the film, yeah. uh, are running around, you know, causing havoc with their girlfriends and Missy and all their loved mm. ones and stuff. Mm. But they don't know that obviously their loved ones don't know why Bill and Ted are acting these way, mm. this way. The princesses and have gone to Missy to hide out because they're acting like dickheads. Yes. They're like rude, isn't it? Yes. Like, yeah. Yeah. So um, they kind of like knock them out with their gnarly breath. And, yeah. They and do that often though, because if I remember, they, they steal the Porsche. Yeah. They come home, then they're eating and acting stupid. The girls take their rings off those kind of pledge rings that they were given because they're not married yet. Yeah, they're, they're still like engaged. engaged yeah. yeah, and then basically what happens is is that um, he gets a call in it. They're like playing with each other, and his head falls off. 
you know, like Bill's head falls off. Yeah, they always then his body starts fighting. Anomalous, yeah, like, so then okay. his eyes glow. So there's always a unique way that Ted becomes like the communicator. The receiver, yeah. Yeah, so first his eyes glow, then his chest glows or something like that. Like something different happens each time. And then, um, so the, the evil uh, Bill and Ted are talking about what they've done, like that we've killed them. You know, we're, we're destroying their image, we're destroying their lives, which is phase two. You know, we've ruined their relationship image. with the girls and stuff. So basically, later on, they're driving the Porsche again. And they're trying to, like, take out cats or, <laughs> you know, like, terminate cats. Because they're, like, you know, cat terminators or something, right? <laughs> and then, you know, basically, they just drive without, like, the seat belts And then crash right through the Porsche through the front of Missy's house. Which is, um, you know, like, either Ted's house or something. Uh, so they're actually at like Ted's house because he's obviously living with uh, with um, their dad and then the girls see them because they go rolling into the fireplace and destroy the fireplace but they're like how did these guys survive yeah and then and then Missy tries to stop them and then uh, there's a nice little in joke where he goes catch you later future wife you know like Alex Winter says you know like because it's like you know he's like and then he uses his kind of like evil breath or something like yeah, that something like to that, knock yeah. her out her android breath <laughs> and it, it kind of knocks her out which makes me laugh and then uh, she gets knocked out the girls get kidnapped uh then you know ironically bill calls missy's house and then the evil uh, bill picks up yeah and he's like it's us they came back from the dead and stuff oh, and they're like, like yeah. we're totally gonna kill you you evil metal dickweeds or something <laughs> right you know so yeah. they so they are all argue with each other and then um things get really urgent because they gotta get to the battle of the bands right yeah so then station kind of walks away and then they think what's going on with station and they're then like, they station, they, they look at each other in this kind of like very antagonistic way and then one of them's like revving up to like run into the other guy while well, the other one looks a little bit meek and worried but they both charge at each other and then they cl collide collide hard and then they they start some kind of like symbiosis where they mutation yeah they merge and then they grow into this massive it's station. Like this guy's like eight, eight foot, foot or something. Like Three hundred. Yeah, and that's actually Muscle station's station. full form. So what it is is when he's like tired or he's relaxing, he splits into two twins. When they merge, their IQ it's merges, double. and that's why they're so small. So station gets to work, and it's my most favorite, one of my most favorite scenes in a movie ever. The editing, the cutting. The music, music by Winger just blew me away. The way Station's working to build the machines, the way the uh, good, the Death good, is Bill looking, and, yeah. and the way they're driving. He creates these awesome robots, the good Bill and Ted, <laughs> out made of out of appliances. appliances. Yeah, out of like, appliances. And I love the animatronic and, and yeah, kind of, kind of the design, uh, man. Yeah. It's just so cool. That's like one of my most favorite scenes in the entire film. If you're not going to watch the entire film, or if you haven't seen the film, if you lived under a rock, go just see that, that check scene. check it out now in 4K. Yeah, you can restored. see it in 4K, restored. Oh my god, this film. Is it out in 4K? I can't remember. Is there it's a Blu-ray yeah, of it? Like, like the first film. Yeah? yeah? Oh man, that's great. I need to pick up a copy because I still got an old one, if I remember correctly, of it. So, um, like, I've only got, like, some kind of... Uh, DVD or something of the second film. I was waiting for it to come out on Blu-ray. So, uh, so great. That scene is wicked when he's welding, he's spraying, yes. the camera angles. You know, never let you get between me and my guitar. So, the tune is epic. Oh, my Kip Winger nailed it. Such a cool tune. So, like, they get to the, the Battle, Battle of, of the, the Bands, bands yeah. right? And what's really cool is is that Bill and Ted are like acting like they're really good, so they're tapping the evil Bill and Ted, and then they're like, you know, we're Bill and Ted, and then they're like, no, we're Bill and Ted, and their audience <laughs> is like, what, 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 and it's like, you know, like so many twists and turns, and then they're like, hey guys, check out uh, Station's most bodacious creation, good evil, good robot Bill and Ted, and then they come through the wall, and everybody's enjoying it, and it has this kind of like. You know, it's a, it's a pumped up bit. Good, yeah, good, and then it. they end up taking them out, which is funny. They didn't even have like a proper fight. Like no, the, the evil like, Androids just got kind of, you know, their popped. heads knocked off and stuff and got taken out. And they were just waiting to get their, their clocks cleaned, <laughs> <laughs> you know, which is really funny. Then the band get ready to play, but they realize that they can't play. And then that's when uh, Pam Greer reveals herself to be Rufus, which is really strange. Because I don't know why, like, the the utilization of George Carlin in the film 
is a little bit strange. And I think perhaps that's because of George Carling's failing health, maybe? His, sec his no, schedule was maybe reduced? his schedule was really difficult. I really don't know. I can't really determine that because I never really like researched what happened. But he got kind of bumped down a bit in his role. And um, so what they do is they take the booth that they go and learn. So they create like a kind of thing where they went off for like a few years to learn how to play. But then they, when they come back, they got this kind of ZZ Top, Jan's Addiction kind of look. So, so yeah. Ted looks more like, you know, Dave Navarro from like uh, Jan's Addiction. And then uh, <laughs> <laughs> Bill's got this kind of ZZ Top kind yeah. of look going on. And then he's got this wicked looking SG. And um, I can't remember like what Ted, Ted, I think Ted's got the SG... Uh, Bill's got some kind of Zach Wild looking yeah, kind of Zach Wild uh, looking, looking kind yeah. of guitar, so it's really sick. So um, you know, it's a sick moment, and it's a really good Kiss song that they use, the "God Gave Rock and Roll to You" kind of song. So Kiss have got like two or three songs that I really like. Uh, you know, Stra uh, um, what's that other one I like of theirs uh, that they play a lot? The the uh, kind of um, the one where they're not wearing makeup. Uh, no, 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 look it up. <laughs> look it up. It's a funny song. That just makes me laugh. I'm talking about, you know, the one, the heart one or something, my love for you sign. It's so wicked that uh... it plays all the time, you know, like on the radio and stuff. I always I forget know, the I name of it. it. Oh, I remember the name when I do like when I review some of Kiss's like albums and stuff. But Strutter and uh, this are really epic songs. This song was epic. It has like such wicked guitar bit. You know, and um, but if you if you, if you remember, like when we saw the film, it never looked as good as it does now. If you look at it, yeah, we saw it, it really so bad at that, and so like crap VHS on TV. and darkness, and we had that weird beard TV. You know, that yeah. old beard TV before we got our Hitachi TV. So my dad had this TV, which was kind of like a leftover of his business. Like he had this old kind of beard TV, and beard were a really tight company. They're not in like Back a in business anymore, but they but that TV's tube started to wear out after about like you know almost like 15 years of life that that tv was hammering on but you know all the when we started playing a lot of like the early playstation and kind of um you know like cd based kind of consoles and things yeah th that tv couldn't take it no more so we ended up picking up a nice hitachi which was a really deep tv and this is also when hitachi were in the market and making tvs they don't make tvs no more yeah so um so everybody yeah. has a good time at the end of the film they're all happy yeah you know, everyone nails it like it. they nail the concert they, they take out the anomalous there's a massive montage at the end about like the wild stallions becoming big yeah. you know and stuff and i thought that that was a really good full circle ending you know i didn't feel like that the, the, there needed to be a third film but then that's when we go into bill and ted face the music because yeah. it talks about yeah. that Which yeah we'll talk about in our own separate review so what are like things we talked about things that we really liked about the film what are things that you didn't like about the film because that's very rare because this is a film for me that i don't have a lot of things i don't like so uh, much there's not really much I don't like. I, I think they could have used George Carlin a little bit more. I mm. think they've underutilized his character because he's a great comedian. And One. they could have had more scenes with him that probably might have gotten cut. You know, there might have been yes. more scenes that yeah. might have been cut in the film. Mm. So we don't know. So You're right, bro. That's one point. The other thing I forgot to touch on is that the anomalous actually comes. Yeah. After Bill and Ted died. So there's a time game. Yeah. The time game returns. Again, where, yeah. Uh, you know, um, they have a kind of time face off with the cage, the gun, you know, the yeah. stuff, and then they trick Denomalus, and then he ends up getting Melvin. That's so, right. So basically, Denomalus gets Melvin, but there's one bit that in the film that I find a little bit dodgy was the bit when he get Melvin. He kind of liked it. So I don't know if they were trying to, if it's got some kind of undertone. Like, I don't know. It's, it's it's a bit. That scene is a bit weird now. Iffy. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit iffy. I, I don't know if it's. A, I don't want to say it, but it's kind of like I don't know if it's like a bit homophobic or something. That scene, you know, like um, because it's like oh he liked it. You know, he's like a bit of a. I don't know. Maybe they're trying to say he's a fairy or something. But you know. Well, yeah, I think because everything is exaggerated so much in the mm -hmm. film, the acting, the yeah. jokes the supernatural elements it kind of plays on that i think a little yeah. bit so that's just something that's a little yeah. bit iffy that's the most kind of i would say that's the most negative scene in the film yeah yeah so should we talk about how many shields and stuff and give it an overall review yeah let's do it let's give it shields i'm gonna give it five shields 
that because this is one of my most favorite movies of all time. It's just really good. So um, I would, yeah, I would personally give it, I think, uh, four and a half shields out of five. Mm. So another four and a half strong one from you. Definitely a recommendation from us. A great film for its time, and um, it's a great film to watch just amongst friends and just you know soak it up and enjoy the jokes and stuff and don't take it too seriously it's a hilarious film and yeah. it's worth watching every every last minute of it yeah and uh, you know like we're always gonna look at it with a kind of like a rose tinted kind of viewpoint because we grew up watching these films so for us you know like the first time you know the second time the third time they become kind of staples in our viewing so after you've got that kind of you you love that stuff it's um you know like it's difficult not to rate them by. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because <laughs> if you if you probably watched it now, you probably think, "What is this?" And you know, like this, it's a it's a film for its time. Yeah, basically, yeah. it's a film for its, its era. Time. It's a yeah. it's a product of its. But era. I tell you now, though, film some films are not as good as this nowadays. No, no, you get what I mean. Like no, the level of like effort and design yeah. and production and stuff. Literally, a lot of a lot of them have become different now. Films. Yeah. yeah. Well, that really wraps up this podcast. So I want to thank Z for joining me. It's always no a pleasure worries. to do stuff with him. And um, it's just wicked. You know, the Rep Knights are on it. We're a great team. And we love this show. So guys, keep subscribing. Keep loving it. Uh, keep rocking on, you know. Um, it's just wicked. So stay tuned for another episode of The House of Rep. I'm your host, filmmaker, director, Ray Jandua. The Rep Knights, we conjure dreams, we forge the future, and we execute the vision. It's all here at the House of Rep. See you on the next one.